Welcome back to Educator.com. This is a lesson on smell, taste, and touch. When we look at nasal anatomy, uh, this main structure of the body that's involved with smelling, of course, there's the nose. That's the most obvious part. It's made up of skin, cartilage, uh, a little bit of fat in there. Um, you also have some bones, but this part here, right, that I'm dudging, is cartilage. It's soft bone. The only bony part of the nose itself is up here at the bridge. These are the two nasal bones. Has a lot to do with the uh, little arch, the bridge of your nose. Uh, if you do break your nose, you tend to break this part up here, the nasal bones. Uh, a, a deep enough kind of trauma could definitely fracture parts of the maxillae or even deeper, the ethmoid bone, which is found straight through and it's making up most of the nasal conchae, those weaving passageways deep within the nose. So mostly cartilage, that's what's making up the majority of this structure. The nasal cavity itself, of course, there's two nostrils that lead into uh, the nasal conchae. Uh, within those nostrils, you're going to have hair and mucus. Uh, you don't see the hair in this particular drawing, but we know it's there. Some people have more than others. Some people trim them. Uh, but the hair serves a purpose. Similar to the ear canal, the hair is trapping dirt, uh, particles from going in deeper. Uh, it, it's minimizing the chances that you're going to get some kind of infection in the upper respiratory tract. Uh, the mucus, of course, is constantly being produced uh, in the nasal conchae, even when you're not sick. Um, that mucus serves numerous purposes. Uh, it actually warms uh, the air that you're uh, inhaling. It, it's going to catch uh, a lot of the stuff that you are inhaling, uh, those microorganisms, uh, bacteria, viruses, etc., that you don't notice, but they're there. And yeah, when you're more sick, uh, you're, you're going to actually produce uh, additional uh, mucus. Um, but the mucus serves a purpose, and even when we're not sneezing it out, um, you're producing it, and you actually tend to swallow it because uh, the nasal cavity does connect to uh, the pharynx, the throat, and every time you swallow, ah, there's going to be a little bit of that nasal mucus that's going to drift back uh, down your esophagus. And I know that sounds disgusting, but it's, it's part of the human body. The conchae are those weaving little caverns uh, named after the fact that they are kind of spirally and twisty and turny like a conch shell. Uh, but the nasal conchae is formed mostly by that ethmoid bone that we discussed in the uh, skeletal lessons. And on top of those weaving caverns of the ethmoid bone, you're going to have those mucous membranes producing the nasal mucus. The cribiform plate is where we focus on for uh, all the action that's going on with your sense of smell. If you remember uh, the ethmoid bone being kind of like an E on its side, and the, these parts of the E are those twisty turny conche parts, this was that perpendicular plate that goes vertical. If you go up to the top, the uh, superior portion of the perpendicular plate, there's another part called the cribiform plate. And that superior, almost perpendicular portion uh, on, on top of that perpendicular plate contains what's called the olfactory epithelium. So the olfactory epithelium is where you have those layers of cells that actually receive those odor molecules and send the signals up to your brain. Olfaction is that technical physiological term for the sense of smell. Um, olfactory receptor cells is a common term. It's not old factory, like, like an old rundown building where they make things, uh, olfaction um, comes presumably from Latin, and it has to do with your sense of smell. So this is the only sense in the human body where the receptor cells, the olfactory receptor cells, are directly adjacent to the outer environment. If you think about the other senses, uh, whether it's touch, uh, whether it's hearing, the receptor cells involved in receiving the signaling are just much deeper. Think about uh, the ear. The, the conch, uh, sorry, the uh, cochlea, rather, uh, that actually has those little hair cells sensitive to the vibrations coming in your ear are really deep inside your head uh, compared with the outer structure of the ear. Not so with the nose. When those odorant molecules go up into your nostrils, they come into contact with mucus where the hairs, the little cilia, of these particular cells are right there. Now you might think, oh, that's great. Uh, it's, it's the closest receptor cells to the outer environment. The problem with that is they can get damaged a lot easier uh, than the neurons of your skin, uh, than the neurons involved with taste, than the neurons involved with hearing. So they actually get regenerated uh, more often than those other cells can. Um, so that's the price you pay for them being so close to the outer environment. 
Olfactory epithelium is that epithelial layer that is involved with actually smelling. Uh, olfactory receptor cells are the main cells that are doing the action. I'm going to highlight them in yellow. So here they are. And they have little hairs that extend out. And I'm drawing them kind of spread out like this because this increases their chances of actually getting an odorant molecule touching them. Uh, having them all spread out, just like, like little roots in the ground. Uh, in this mucus layer, having all these little hairs spread out is just going to increase the chances of reception. Basal cells are those little cells in this region that are actually functioning as like a stem cell. So as these olfactory receptor cells get damaged, basal cells can go through mitosis, and as those cells mature, they take the place of damaged or old olfactory cells. Olfactory glands, which aren't depicted very well in this particular picture, are just glands that produce the mucus. So that mucus layer that's right in here that these uh, cilia are actually um, embedded in uh, that's where the mucus comes from. Um, you know, different, a little bit different than the glands within the skin. Uh, they're producing mucus that's located in the nasal conche. And um, yeah, the olfactory system can distinguish 2,000 to 4,000 different chemical stimuli. So as those odorant molecules come up into this passageway and hit the little cilia, it's just like action potentials from previous lessons. As the cilia get hit, those open up channels where the sodium potassium moves and it activates these cells just like another neuron. These are modified to react to odors. Now, if you sat down and, and drew a, or wrote out a list of all the different odors that you remember smelling, like, oh, you know, orange, uh, lavender, etc. It'd be hard to come up with a list of 2,000 to 4,000. Um, we don't always consciously uh, remember uh, that we, we can smell these different things, but in terms of how the brain reacts to different stimuli, uh, we found that there are thousands of different chemicals uh, that affect uh, your olfactory receptor cells just a little bit differently. So when it comes to olfactory receptors, uh, like I mentioned before, these are highly modified neurons that respond to these odors or odorant molecules. Each one of them has about 20 cilia that extend into the surrounding mucus. Uh, as I mentioned, remember they're in the cribriform plate and those little cilia are spreading out. You have approximately 10 to 20 million olfactory receptor cells in an area of five cubic centimeters. It's a tiny area with a lot of cells. And that's impressive to think about. It's even more impressive to think about an animal like a German Shepherd, which has 70 times that area. <laughs> so smells to them so much more obvious. I mean, think about uh, a German Shepherd being used at an airport to smell packages uh, to see if there's, you know, contraband or explosives. Smells are so obvious to that animal, it's like us looking at colors on the ground. So when a dog is tracking a smell, it's it's presumably that obvious. Um, so it's, it's fascinating to think what it'd be like to be inside the head of that animal. There's lots of turnover of olfactory receptor cells, and, and this is a rare example of adult neuron replacement. Uh, think about the spinal cord with all the cells running down there. If you damage spinal cord neurons enough, you don't get them back. Uh, they're damaged for life, and that results in paraplegia or quadriplegia, depending on what area you damage. And eventually we'll get there with, with curing uh, those conditions. But this is something that naturally happens where, you know, because these neurons are so close to the outer environment, they tend to get damaged more readily. And um, replacing them able, is able, uh, enables you rather uh, to smell all the stuff you like smelling, even as an, an elderly adult. Smells can be noticed in very small concentrations. An example, beta mercaptan. This is a chemical that's added to gases that are naturally odorless, like butane, propane, natural gas. Without adding small bits of beta mercaptan, if there was a gas leak in your house or apartment and all the windows were closed, you wouldn't even be able to smell that this gas is entering the room and it could actually result in more deaths if we didn't have this in there. So just adding a touch of this gas that has an odor saves lives every year. And these cells have a dramatic effect on taste. I'm sure you've heard this that, um, or experienced this, if you're sick and you have a lot of swelling in your, your nasal region in the upper respiratory tract and a lot of additional production of mucus, Food tastes more bland um, 
you know, when you're sick. So, so we take this for granted that, you know, taste is affected by olfaction. I've heard estimates that up to 50% of taste is impacted uh, by this particular um, uh, set of cells. Here's a trick you can do at home. If you close your eyes and plug your nose and have somebody uh, put in your mouth uh, a piece of apple and a piece of pear um, without you knowing which one is which, if they're both the same, you know, ripeness, about the same density or consistency, it's really hard without looking and smelling, uh, telling the difference between the pear and the apple. So that's one example of how smell would assist you with that. Um, I have a relative who actually has a problem with his sense of smell. Uh, and he didn't know this until he was helping out my uncle with a construction job. They were redoing a room. And uh, everyone who was on the site was told not to go in this room because there was a really caustic chemical uh, that's actually harmful to, to inhale. And, it, and it's a chemical that once you walk in the room, you would smell. Well, my relative who has the smelling problem didn't hear that announcement. So he goes in the room uh, sometime during that day and he doesn't have a mask on and he's working on something. And my, my uncle looks in, he's like, what are you doing in here? Don't you smell that? Smell what? And obviously, it's, it would be weird to not smell this. So they took him to the doctor. And after some tests, they realized that he only has 10% of the olfaction ability as the average human being. He's missing 90% of what he should be experiencing. Um, I don't know what taste is like to him. And we would never know unless you get inside of his head because he had no idea he was lacking that smelling ability until they confirmed it with some tests. So that's interesting to think about. And last thing I want to mention about olfaction is that uh, you already heard this before in the uh, nervous system lessons, if you watch those, but smell has a profound connection uh, to memory. This is the only one of the five major senses that does not go through the medulla, through the thalamus. This goes straight up into uh, the parts of the cerebrum that lead to the cerebral cortex. A and that actually connects to memory quite a bit. If you look at the tracks uh, for olfactory receptors and how they go up into those you know, olfactory bulbs and those little tracks all the way up, they bypass, or, or sorry, not bypass rather, they go straight through the areas that have to do with memory. So they go right through uh, parts of the limbic system that have to do with memory. The hippocampus is right there. So you may have heard that smell is connected to memory greatly. It is. Um, you know, if, if you smell, you know, freshly baked cookies and think of grandma, that's what we're talking about. Olfaction connected to memory in a great way. When it comes to taste, uh, we got to talk about the mouth, of course. The tongue is the major player in your ability to taste, but it's not just the tongue. If we do look at the tongue, uh, in this particular picture, you can see that the person is you know, lifting up their tongue and touching the roof of their mouth, the little bumps, you don't see quite as many on the underside. It's, it's hard to distinguish those, but I like this picture because you can see that they're labeling some of the salivary glands. These are called sublingual, which literally means under the tongue. Here's the floor of the mouth. Here's how the tongue is attached to the, the mandible bone. And of course, you got your gums and the interior cheek, the teeth, etc. Within the tongue itself, you've got multiple muscles, and these muscles are incredibly strong for their size. Um, I've heard different textbooks say that the heart is the strongest muscle. I've heard some say that the tongue is the strongest muscle. Um, the tongue is very strong, I can tell you that. Dentists will tell you that the tongue can actually, over time, change the position of your teeth. It can actually change how your teeth are laying um, in, your, in your mandible, and that's, and that's pretty incredible to think about. That's a lot of power. On the surface of the tongue, you have what are called papillae. Each one is a papilla. And, and those bumps, you actually shouldn't call them taste buds. The proper term is papillae when you actually see those bumps on the surface of the tongue. And the papillae, within them, there are taste buds that have these gustatory cells or taste cells. The pharynx is the throat and the larynx is a bit deeper uh, down there, but taste is there too. Now, a lot of those uh, taste cells, uh, they're reduced as you age, as you get into adulthood, but the pharynx and the larynx have a little bit of ability to allow you to perceive some tastes. And I'll tell you uh, more about that later. Uh, salivary glands, they have a lot to do with taste. If it wasn't for saliva, uh, number one, you wouldn't have that aqueous medium that allows the cells of the papillae to get that signal noticed. Uh, but also within the salivary uh, secretions, you have enzymes. Uh, enzymes break down those chemicals, those, those compounds that you are chewing. Um, 
without that that enzyme ability, you wouldn't be able to perceive those, those little tastes that you experience on a daily basis. Uh, here's an example of that. One of the many enzymes that um, salivary glands are releasing is salivary amylase. And amylase, I'll write it out for you, is responsible for breaking down uh, larger carbohydrates or sugars into tiny little bits like glucose, monosaccharides. And glucose we perceive as being sweet. Uh, larger carbohydrates like starch don't taste as sweet when, when they're that big molecular structure, that polysaccharide. Uh, you could try this at home. Normally when you eat a cracker, you chew it a few times, swallow it before you get the, uh, the um, ability to, to sense the glucose inside of there. So there are large carbohydrates that make up breads or crackers. If you chew it and let the little bits sit on your tongue with saliva and just uh, just don't chew it, don't swallow it immediately, just just chew it a little bit and, and let it sit there for a while, you can actually eventually get this more sweet taste uh, from, from the little tiny glucoses and the other tiny sugars that are inside the cracker. And you're giving your salivary glands a chance to like just break that down further before swallowing it. Taste cells are scattered all around the mouth and throat. Like I said, um, there are some of the pharynx and the larynx, specifically the part of the larynx that you're going to see some taste cells on, especially in, in younger uh, people, is on the epiglottis. And you're going to hear more about that with the digestive system. The epiglottis is a flap that closes on the respiratory uh, tract so that when you swallow foods, it doesn't go in your lungs. Uh, but You'll see that, um, you know, the ability to taste like sugar, um, you know, sweetness, sour, bitter, etc., cetera, um, not as profound on, on the throat and larynx. Uh, most of them are on the tongue and some of them are around uh, the sides of the mouth. The structure of a papilla, uh, those are the bumps. If you take a little cross section straight through one of those little bumps on the surface of the tongue, here is that papilla, and considering this is a cross-section, um, you're only seeing part of it. A, a papilla is round, and so around the, the edge of it, there is kind of like this, this like ditch, uh, a, a crevice, if you will. And here are two sides of the crevice around a papilla, and these little guys right here, those are the taste buds. So each one of these, taste bud, taste bud, taste bud, taste bud, taste bud, taste bud. That's why calling this a taste bud is not proper. This is a papilla. Within a taste bud, here's one pictured here, you have gustatory or taste cells uh, that are afferent. They are sensory neurons that, you know, obviously take um, stimuli up into your central nervous system. Each one of those cells is right here. Let me highlight that in yellow. Here's one of these gustatory cells, here's another, and here's the third. And you can see that each one of them has this little hair. And these little hairs project out into this little crevice and saliva can get into those little areas and that's what's gonna enable the hairs to be activated uh, effectively um, so that you get those action potentials and, and that reception happening of those different tastes. Transitional cells are the ones that are in between, supporting cells for the taste bud. Basal cells, like with the sense of smell, are stem cells that enable you to you know, regenerate these. I've heard that uh, taste cells only last for about 10 days. Uh, so you do need some uh, regeneration of them over time as you lose them. And then nerve fibers. The nerve fibers are right here. And they're, they're really axons that come together to uh, form the, the, the nerve eventually that goes up into your central nervous system. Now, when it comes to taste sensations, uh, the, the major tastes that we experience, there are four major ones, sweet, salty, bitter, sour. If you've ever seen one of those tongue maps that says, oh, here's the sweet area, here's the sour area, here's the bitter, salty, etc." that's not how it really is. You can't say that, oh, this is the sweet part of the tongue. Now, certain parts of the tongue can be slightly better than others at perceiving certain taste sensations, but all over, all of your different taste buds have the ability to notice all four of them. Um, you can try it yourself. Uh, you know, put salt here, put salt back there. You're going to notice the salt all over your tongue. Uh, so sweet, how does that happen? Um, Sweet sensations come from 
sugars, of course. So when we uh, break down sugars uh, through chewing, saliva, etc., uh, you're going to get that sweetness. And of course, with breads, with uh, candy, uh, all those things, um, that gives us those sweet sensations. Glucose, fructose, galactose, etc., are going to activate um, gustatory cells in that way. Salty, the most common one would be, of course, NaCl, sodium chloride, uh, but they're all kinds of salts. If you take chemistry, um, salts is like a category of um, ionic compounds. Uh, bitter, um, you know, it's not just horseradish. Um, bitterness, uh, slightly uh, bitter sensations, um, like with, um, oh, what's the name of that green? Uh, arugula. Arugula tastes slightly bitter. I like it, some people don't. Uh, and the way people perceive bitterness uh, can vary. Sour. Sour is actually uh, from acids. So if you like sour candy, uh, you have an affinity for, uh, for acids, um, acidic molecules. And, and, you know, acids have a bad rap. Uh, if you've taken chemistry, you know that strong acids are the kinds that are going to actually, you know, burn through uh, the surface of your tongue or can harm your skin if you get them on you. But uh, we eat a lot of uh, acidic foods. Um, milk is slightly acidic. Tomatoes, slightly acidic. If you go to you know, oranges and lemons, you're getting even more acidic. Uh, but we do consume a lot of foods that are ever so slightly acidic. Fruits uh, are a nice balance between sweet, having those natural sugars, and a little bit of sour, like citric acid. Umami. This fifth one is more recently talked about. It is a Japanese word, and umami... Uh, I've heard that in the back of the tongue is even a slightly greater ability to, to perceive this umami flavor. And it's been described to me as um, uh, savory, meaty, even perfect uh, as a translation for umami. Sushi, in my opinion, is a good example of what that umami flavor is all about. Uh, beef broth, I've also heard of chicken broth, is another one that um, can be slightly different than these four. Water. What? Does water have a taste? Um, you might think, no, the only way water would have a taste is if there's something dissolved in the water, like metallic ions or something that doesn't belong there. But water, research has shown that, especially in the back of the throat, like the pharynx, uh, those taste receptors there do respond to water and send signals to your brain. Now, you may not consciously realize that like this water has a flavor as it goes down, but uh, if you take a very long swig of water, especially if you've been dehydrated, you do sense that water going down and it tells your brain to actually change the amount of ADH being secreted. Now, ADH is antidiuretic hormone. It's a hormone that allows your body to hold on to water. You won't uh, actually urinate quite as much if you're releasing ADH. Now, if you just drank a lot of water, uh, that means you don't need to hang on to quite as much water as you had been. So the fact that um, the water uh, signals neurons to change something that's happening in your brain. We can describe that as a taste sensation. And finally, PTC, number seven. I put it down here because this is um, kind of a peculiar one. If you've taken biology classes, you may have done this, uh, a PTC paper. It stands for phenyl theocarbamide. Uh, PTC papers uh, usually look like little rectangular thin papers, and you'll pass them out to your students and say, all right, on the count of three, everybody, touch it here, tongue. And so when they touch it to their tongue, after a few seconds, people who can actually taste PTC get this profound bitterness, like, ugh, I'm one of the people that can taste it. And I've read that, um, this was a few years ago, but I've read that approximately 70% of Americans have the genotype to enable them to actually notice PTC. About 30% of people don't. And it's because when you look at the genetics of this, it's actually a dominant allele that allows you to um, uh, perceive uh, PTC as this chemical. And if you're homozygous recessive, you know, like little a, little a, uh, if you inherited those, those alleles, you can't notice PTC. And this is one of the many examples that shows you that genetics plays a role in taste. Uh, there are probably lots of genes that determine your taste uh, abilities. Now, some people uh, I, I've heard just, just don't like broccoli at all. I love broccoli. I don't even need uh, salt and butter. I'll just, you know, eat it plain. But some people, no matter how many times they've tried broccoli, even as an adult, they've given it many chances, they can't stand it. Now, maybe uh, compared to me, they're uh, able to, to taste some kind of chemical in the broccoli that I don't. So because I don't notice it, I love it. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot out there in terms of um, 
genetics and how uh, taste is affected. And I wrote and more because, hey, there's lots of genes that impact your taste sensations. When it comes to touch, um, there are a few types of sensory receptors in the skin corresponding to touch. One of the main ones is nociceptors, and that's for pain. Now, pain comes in different forms, and we'll get to that in a sec, but nociceptors in general have to do with pain being perceived, and mechanoreceptors, physical distortion. If you're wondering, well, what is physical distortion? That's physical distortion. That's physical distortion. That's physical distortion. Anytime that you're touched in a way that manipulates your skin, um, light, heavy, uh, deep pressure, that's going to be mechanoreceptors that are going to be stimulated. And here's, of course, a cross-section of skin, epidermis here, and uh, at the bottom, you've got that stratum basale. All of this is the dermis. You can see that these are blood vessels. Here's a coiled up sweat gland, and here's a hair follicle leading to a hair emerging from the root. They're not depicting uh, neurons in here. They're not depicting these little uh, receptors. Here's one example. You could have a little corpuscule, and you'll see what a corpuscle is in a bit. And they're at different levels. Some of them are really deep. Uh, some of them are actually much more superficial. And you can see this one's right at the top, the super, uh, more superficial part of the dermis, just deep to the epidermis. And these are scattered all throughout the skin, uh, specifically in the dermis. So let's start with pain. Uh, nociceptors, these pain receptors, are sensitive to a few different kinds of pain, or in terms of how the pain uh, results. Uh, temperature, of course, uh, if you've ever had boiling water, um, you know, hit your skin, you know uh, that temperature changes can cause uh, pain to occur. And it's not just heat. Um, if you uh, have been, uh, you know, next to dry ice, they say do not touch dry ice because it is way, 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 way colder uh, than solid water. Um, dry ice is solid CO2 and touching it uh, can actually cause a burn, uh, which is, seems ironic to say burn, but it will actually um, damage your skin and uh, it's not something you want in terms of the pain that results. Mechanical damage, that's, you know, cuts, that's lacerations, that's um, mechanically harming the skin is of course going to cause pain. And chemicals, um, having a strong acid or a strong base, some kind of alkaline substance landing on your skin is of course going to cause pain. Now the amazing thing is sometimes one kind of stimulus, one kind of uh, set of trauma will actually uh, stimulate a lot of different types of pain. That's why some people, um, you know, they'll get a wound, like let's say it's a deep cut with a knife, they'll describe it as a hot burning sensation, even though it's just mechanical damage that's happened. So sometimes uh, a certain kind of stimulus can be perceived as various types of pain all at once. Uh, the difference between fast pain and slow pain is basically this. Fast pain is a different kind of neuron track. These are type A fibers. These are type C fibers. Fast pain tends to be stuff like needles, uh, a knife. So if you've gotten a shot, let's say a booster shot uh, in your shoulder, and ah, you know, when that needle goes in, it's it's a fast pain, literally, and uh, goes along a certain kind of nerve fiber um, up to uh, uh, the central nervous system, the cerebral cortex, you, you feel it right away. Slow pain uh, tends to be uh, kind of that like dull, aching, um, not as localized, like a fast pain, it's like a sharp pain that you know exactly where it is, and slow pain sometimes will just be a general area. And this slow pain actually goes up more into the um, reticular formation thalamus region, uh, more so than, than the fast pain in terms of how it's perceived. And yes, pain is complex in terms of perception. Um, you know, scientists and doctors uh, will spend their whole careers on pain and how to treat pain, uh, how to help with pain in a patient. And in terms of the complexity uh, of how pain is perceived in the human body, we don't know all the answers. Um, you know, some people will have nothing wrong with them. They'll do tests on their organs, on, on their whole body, MRIs, CAT scans, etc. And 
sometimes it won't be obvious what, what is actually the, the root of the pain. Why is this person having this pain? And sometimes it's just um, pain that's being perceived by the person chronically and they can't narrow down why it's happening. And yes, there are medications that can help in terms of um, lessening those action potentials and, and, and lessening uh, the, the neurotransmitter's ability to make pain happen inside of your head. But it's amazing to think about that. Um, there's something else called referred pain, uh, which is pretty fascinating. So referred pain is uh, some people, when they get a heart attack, will get this numbness and pain all throughout their left arm. Your heart is not here. Yes, it is slightly on the left side of your chest, but the reason why that referred pain happens is there are similar nerve tracks in terms of how they come into your spinal cord. Uh, the nerves in your left arm actually kind of run right into the nerves from the heart. And so a heart attack will actually affect these nerves in terms of the stimuli coming up into your brain. And so there's a sensation that something's wrong with the left arm. So if that happens in someone you're with, uh, call 911 if they get a really deep uh, pain all of a sudden in their left arm. Another one is the gallbladder. Uh, amazingly, uh, pain in the gallbladder can actually be felt up here on the shoulder. So that's called referred pain, one of the many fascinating topics associated with uh, nociceptors. When it comes to mechanoreceptors, these are uh, in terms of how your skin is literally touched. And we can call them uh, tactile receptors because it has to do with literally being touched. Free nerve endings are found all throughout um, especially the top uh, superior part, sorry, superficial is the better word, superficial parts of the dermis. Let's say this is the surface of the epidermis, and here is the, the bottom or deeper part of the epidermis, and here is the dermal layer. Free nerve endings, these are dendrites, will extend up to those superficial parts of the dermis. So as you get touched here, they're going to be stimulated. And, and those are found all throughout. The root hair plexus, here's a hair shaft. It's kind of thick, but it'll do. Uh, and here's the hair follicle. And of course, you're going to have blood supply, you know, going to this uh, hair. Wrapped around part of the hair shaft is something called a root hair plexus. So it's being wrapped around here. And the amazing thing is when a hair is brushed, that's going to stimulate uh, the root hair plexus. And something as simple as like just this, I can, I can feel it very easily, even though my, my fingers were not actually touching the surface of my epidermis. Uh, this especially happens when you're moving garments around. Um, part of the fabric won't even, like right here, this fabric is not even touching the surface of my epidermis, but it's touching the hairs on my arm, and that's going to be noticed. So that's amazing. It's such a fine kind of stimulus, but that's stimulating root hair plexus. Uh, tactile discs, also called Merkel discs, uh, these are also for fine touch. They are extremely sensitive. Um, they look a little bit different. Merkel discs, when they extend up, they have these little discs. Uh, that's pretty much what they look like. Tactile corpuscles, also called Meisner corpuscles, these look more like kind of a uh, sort of roundish um, bulb in a sense. So a Meisner corpuscle looks like this. And um, these particular corpuscles, um, they have a lot to do with um, sensing pressure. And, and they're concentrated more in the eyelids, um, the lips, the fingers, nipples, and the external genitalia. Lamellated corpuscles, similar look, uh, but the thing that's distinguishing about these corpuscles is it looks like kind of concentric circles, almost like a fingerprint. Uh, but lamellated corpuscles have that appearance. You don't see that that concentric circle look quite as much in the Meisner ones. Uh, but these lamellated corpuscles, uh, they also correspond to deep pressure. Um, deep pressure, something not quite as like fine as what I was talking about earlier, kind of that deeper pressure. And Ruffini corpuscles, uh, when you look at the collagen fibers all throughout the dermis, these are associated with that. So when it comes to like um, kind of those 
uh, deep manipulations of the collagen within the dermis, Ruffini corpuscles are definitely going to be stimulated. So let's say that this is uh, collagen fiber. You can have these little uh, corpuscles, Ruffini corpuscles, innervating, just kind of coming in and being a part of all those collagen tracks. And, and those are located uh, throughout the body. Um, have to do a little bit with, with deeper stimulation than some of these other ones, uh, but they are there in your skin. Baroreceptors have a lot to do with um, pressure. Um, and so we're not as conscious of these, but um, they are in the skin. So in terms of the blood vessels that are located, especially in the deeper parts of your integumentary system, the skin, um, have to do with pressure. For instance, um, if there is a change in blood volume, baroreceptors are going to notice it. If there's a change in blood pressure, that's going to cause manipulation of um, those blood vessels. Uh, you're going to see baroreceptors in um, the... Uh, aorta and in the carotid uh, arteries and uh, of course they, they communicate with the brain readily in terms of um, how to manipulate blood pressure when it needs to be manipulated and uh, proprioceptors have a lot to do with joint position um, and, and tension associated with the joints and the capsules so your skin is pretty close to a lot of these areas where your joints are um, so proprioceptors uh, in terms of how joints are moving, uh, your brain is going to sense that in terms of the positioning of them and, and how they're being uh, manipulated. So tendons, ligaments, joints have a lot of these what are called proprioceptors. So there's touch, uh, smell, and taste. Thanks for watching educator.com.